Welcome back to the Start Well Podcast. Once again, I am Kasim in studio on King Street West here in Toronto at Startwell's campus. Uh, today, for the 44th episode of our podcast, I'm joined in studio by the lovely Camille Moore from Third Eye Insights. And uh, I'm very, very interested to hear all about what you guys do and more importantly, um, what you do. Because I've seen you around campus, we've talked, we've bantered a little bit. Um, but we haven't really dug into kind of like the state of marketing and how you guys are like ahead of the curve and what, you know, you want to be doing with your company. So all that is stuff that we can talk about. Welcome to the studio. Thank you, Kasim. Um, so let's start with introductions, Camille. Who are you? What do you do? Wow. That's a deep question. (laughs) (laughs) Um, my name is Camille Moore. I, uh, co-own Third Eye Insights. Uh, Third Eye Insights is a very cool marketing agency that we kind of define as uh, an agency that specializes in branding, strategy, and experience. Mm -hmm. Uh, We specialize in marketing uh, professional services. So that's anyone or any business that sells a service opposed to a product. Mm -hmm. So I, I tend to not market a mug, mm-hmm. I would market. Like I do? You. This is my job. <laughs> I market Startwell mugs. So that's kind of the niche that we got into and apparently it's working. It's doing well. Well, it's interesting because professional services people, accountants, lawyers. Doctors. Doctors. Uh, the furthest thing from from what they want to be thinking about and wasting to them their time on is like talking to people that are not their patients or clients and figuring out why it's important to do that. It's a really interesting um, personality that gets into ser- uh, like professional services because they tend to not be very creative. Mm-hmm. So the whole concept of marketing themselves or their business is totally abstract to them. But it's also really interesting because these same professions are credence professions. So they tend to have, they're at the kind of the, 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 the upper end of society. You know, lawyers and doctors are, or were once ex- very well looked up to. It's very hard to become. You're living in the 50s, ma'am. I, exactly. But that's, but that's the most interesting thing about digital marketing and, and what we do because it was so, um, it had so much credibility before the advent of the internet. So what made a doctor or a lawyer so prestigious is that they held all the information. Right. So it, it they were, it tended to attract encyclopedic brains, yeah. people who could just memorize textbooks of information, test well, and then the average person wouldn't have access to that information. Mm. But what changed was Google and how the average person is educated. And we require information before hiring to make a decision. So think about the last time you went to a doctor's office. You've pre-diagnosed yourself. You're just going in to get the corroboration on your pre-diagnosis. It's a funny example because, you know, my wife's a family practice doctor. She's, cool. she's a doctor, a GP. So, uh, yeah, in some ways, that's true. For me, less than others, maybe. Yeah, I like to bad think, example. I like to think I have a doctor in the family, but that also means that I don't have a doctor in the family. They're like, that's the furthest thing from what I want to be talking about right now. Go away with your problems. Go see your own doctor. That's what my wife tells me all the time. <laughs> but also, like, I'm, I'm sure your wife has seen with her colleagues, like, the first thing that most of them are doing for, there's so much foreign stuff that comes into their office, they go in the back room and Google it on Mayo Clinic. Or they're Googling it as well, trying to figure things out when they get really rare cases in front of them. Like, the internet changed our <laughs> access to information, and that's yeah. why marketing is so important for service providers, because, as you said, they're often very bad at marketing themselves. They're often, they they use a convoluted or different language than the end user Mm. is using to try to find them. That's a great point. As a problem solving service provider. And then third, the acts, like you have to be ahead of the information. You have to give away the information because your client or customer or patient is going to get it regardless. Mm -hmm. You want them to get it through you. And that's more so with the lawyers Lawyers than I would say a GP. But it's just, it's interesting that that barrier to information has changed or is gone with the advent of Google. And that's what we do. Yeah. 
you make these people accessible and kind of help explain what they do, make them more visible. More visible, audiences. yeah, more, um, uh, exactly. We create brands. So we create a brand and the brand is rooted in um, putting the, so another piece that that's probably worth explaining. What's interesting, so marketing in Canada, I would say, is behind marketing in the States. Mm-hmm. Why is that? And in what, yeah, like, in what ways is it behind? Um, is it to do with the population density or distribution, or is it to do with? Uh, I also just think it's. It, there's probably a bunch of reasons. The, the one of the main reasons, though, is like we're also behind in fashion. We're behind in some would argue healthcare. Like there's, but I think it also is demand. Like we don't have to work as hard because there's not as many people. Mm-hmm. So that I find with service providers especially lawyers, like they're really adverse to risk. They're really adverse to change and they look very much inside their inner circle to what the other people are doing. Mm -hmm. So they stay exceptionally antiquated right? because it's, 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 we're not a very competitive society. Maybe that's it. So the traditional industries don't necessarily feel the need to innovate in these ways that you help with. Totally. Um, But then also the, because they're looking inwards and their marketing is antiquated and, the same it makes if i'm looking to hire a lawyer yeah the ability to decide which one is the best one for me oh it's a nightmare very hard because all of their websites look the same so we really focus on working with really cool people first and foremost like Mm -hmm. people that really care about what they do love love their practice taking care of patients clients customers and then using their humanity and their uniqueness as their marketing differentiator so that and the lawyers we work with their stories like one of the one of our you know favorite favorite lawyers is uh, out of Albuquerque New Mexico mm. and he got into personal injury law and until kind of going through the branding experience with us didn't connect that his father fought for union rights in New Mexico in the 60s and a big part of his advocation for workers comp personal injury comes from this almost like unconscious uh, love for his father and like he's watching like him carrying, as a child he's, he's waving the flag that his his dad he grew up around that his dad flying and what a great brand like yeah. if if you if you've been hurt at your place of work and you're looking for the right person to fight for you that doesn't see this as a cash grab what a great marketing message to have but did you uh still um, did you get him to take the ads off the buses? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. There is no size matter billboards <laughs> oh with this lawyer, which it kills me. But that's so great, great thing to bring up. Yeah, there's so much sameness and so, like it's so archaic. These billboard ads that say nothing to me, probably say nothing to you. Like right. we want to find someone when our life is on the line, when it's illness. A, a, something to do with the law you want the real estate the best person for the job maybe i don't know the stats maybe there's a high proportion of personal injury on the road because people drove into buses and hey (laughs) when you kind of wake up from your bad ad ad. (laughs) it's like yeah the the ad causes the crash and then you call the number for help i I also just think there's so much variance especially in the united states like it obviously works I, I, who am I to say it doesn't work? Right. But because there's so much variance, there's so much business to be made for, that's the whole, like, that's the whole argument is everything is in abundance. It's not scarcity. You need to find more of the best people for you or the, the ideal client for you. And the best way to find more of them is to put who you are front facing. Right. Because I have clients who... Uh, are very very politically vocal Mm. and that's important to them if they only want to work with a certain kind of person right so be who you are whatever that looks like that's weird what you just said can you speak to an example yeah like one of the um, so one of the law firms that we work with that does exceptionally well just does reels talking about things that are in the news. So most recently is the Amber Heard Johnny Depp trial. Yeah, what the hell was that about? It. I just kept seeing it pop up on YouTube. 
And I was like, I watched two minutes of it. And I was like, okay, this is weird. This is like a new form of, this is not OJ. You no, know? but it's kind of, it was, it was kind of the best case at the best time for kind of the Me Too movement gone wrong oh. of like people, people hungry for the, let's stop taking claims at face value and ruining people's lives when there are 10% of bad actors who are male who do bad things. So she was attacked. She was basically saying, you did something bad to me. I want money. And and uh, the popular opinion was she was using kind of a, a, a social a social movement wrongly. Right. Disingenuously. And this lawyer uh, does reels and topics on a bunch of things, but gives kind of his uh, respected opinion on a case like this. And where I'm going with this is there are people who are out there that are pro Amber Heard, regardless of the outcome. And by him vocalizing his educated opinion on something he can talk about, but is also kind of pop culture, Mm. allows him to indirectly attract more of a kind of clientele that aligns with his values, which causes, in a world of, and Google reviews are so important for service providers, Mm -hmm. less negative reviews because you're able to work with more people that align with you as a human being. It's super interesting because uh, fundamentally what you said in your profiling of your customers is they're service providers, yeah. right? And that aspect of service is historically, you know, personal. Like we talked about, okay, advertising on buses. But realistically, I mean, I, I think if I ask, you know, 10 out of 10 people or 9 out of 10 people that I would ask that I know, like friends, um, where did you find your doctor? Where did you find a lawyer that's like, let's say... We're not like, not a personal injury lawyer, maybe not a divorce lawyer, but kind of everyday stuff. Yeah. And it's through personal referral. Totally. And so you're looking for these like networks of, you know, uh, what would you call it? Like networks of, of authentic feedback. Totally. But uh, yeah, what's interesting about that is that's kind of the, the, I would say the most common rebuttal I get is like, you know, most of my business comes in through referral or word of mouth. But that's but, the best marketing. But what's interesting about that is if you ask me, hey, Camille, do you know of a great hairstylist or do you know a great painter, right? I'm going to tell you a name. You're probably going to Google them to mm-hmm. validate right. my referral. Right. You won't you're, take it at, at like 100%. I trust this because it can't You'll check out their website. You'll check out their Google reviews. You'll go to their Facebook or their Instagram page. Mm-hmm. And that needs to support the referral that you got and while you're doing that there's ads that are popping up there's other competitors that are showing up and you better be as good or better of all the noise that will come up in between finding that or what they find when they search you to ensure that that you get that referral and there's almost like an opportunity cost of Mm. all the business you potentially lost by not investing in that in that digital presence and doing it well and then the to like take it a step further I find that especially in kind of what I'm doing and where I'm going and and probably also my age there's a lot my network is my biggest asset Mm -hmm. but they don't know what I'm doing and that's why social media is so great because it allows me to have my own megaphone to people that already know me Mm -hmm. already have hopefully a good opinion of me and understand my skill sets, my personality, et cetera, and now know what I'm doing so that if that conversation comes up, they might not have thought to refer me, but now they are because they're they're aware of the stuff that I'm doing and I'm posting. Right. No, it's super interesting. I think you're right that like the nature, like it's, it's very easy to say uh, that conventional wisdom is that word of mouth is the best referral engine and that is somehow at odds with effortful marketing you know everyone wants to like until they're a shopkeeper they want to assume that shops will stay open because they're literally you know have their door to the street and people walk in when they want to walk in Uh, kind of what we saw in the pandemic of course is that retail collapses when that's the kind of status quo and there's no pedestrians of course it dies but it's more than the people walking by it's the people who want to 
get into that vicinity to walk in the door, et cetera. Like, so I think you need to put yourself out there, you know? You need totally. to be on the street to be seen. Well, also, even if you look at, like, your business, like, the amount of, uh, I, I would say I'm, I'm a major evangelist for your brand because you Thank didn't you. do anything at good enough, right? Like, everything you've Excuse done. Excuse me? No, I'm saying everything you've done, you've taken a step further. <laughs> oh, okay. No, it's, it, none of it has been mediocre. Like, you're, oh, you're like, nothing you do is good. No, 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 no. I'm saying the opposite. I'm saying, you know yeah, my I didn't story. didn't stop at good enough. No, yeah. you you've, you focused on branding. You've got great brand. Yep. The experience is exceptional. Thank you. And your strategy for attracting who, the, the kind of person that's within the King West vibe and beyond with the studio, with your content creator studio, with your, like the approach you took to the concept of this business, you know, my story, I started at a co working space down the street. We won't name names, but I didn't tell anybody to go there. If anything, it was like, I just needed to get out of my house. It's good enough. Good and enough, yeah. it's the difference between having a great experience and an okay one that makes me an evangelist for your brand and pushes referrals further than they have to extract out of me. Hey, do you know somewhere to work? Opposed to, I today was working at Startwell. I post about working at Startwell. I right. love the experience of Startwell, which is which is different. Yeah, and it's, it's, I mean, like, okay, so ever since, how long has it been? I don't know, maybe a, at least a decade that people have been talking about using digital media to activate your brand, right? Um, probably... Now it's been 15 years, maybe, since that book, uh, The Clue Train Manifesto. Yeah. Right? Classic. Talking about, like, long tail, talking about putting stuff out there because it might be read in 10 years or might be watched in five years or, you know, the one out of a thousand people in the audience might actually connect with it in a way that would give you so much more value. Yeah. So you're kind of um, always investing in the future when you create content and, and put yourself out there and... And market digitally, um, and two points to that quickly. Yeah, the the real like the real estate concept. We always say, like real estate, the best time to have bought was twenty years ago. Mm. The second best time is today. Yeah, and now. and now, and it's it, it's not going anywhere. Like digital real estate is, it's it, it's not only paramount. It's it's literally whether you're going to make it or not in the next decade. Like mm. the option to decide to do that has passed. It's now, what is your strategy and uh, an approach to do it, and how basically minimal are are you going to be able to start? Because it's just no longer a question. And and the point to the long tail, that's that's a concept that we've we've been able to scale based on. Like we're not necessarily now we're in a place as the agency that we're big enough that we want to go after the behemoths. You want to work with the behemoths because they're the ones that we can really do some cool stuff from mm. a. In terms of like customer profile? Yeah, okay. yeah. Like now we're able to do that, but we started by just working with mostly like people who left big firms to work on their own. Mm. The kind of the solopreneur where that there's a long tail in their approach because you can be extremely successful with a great brand positioning value mm -hmm. and charging within a whatever you can accommodate as kind sure. of a, a, a small boutique shop or a, a one a one man show. Mm -hmm. But um, the long tail is something that, and Seth Godin talks about this, a, a big marketing guy. Everyone is always looking for just like that, that super small, the Nike, the Adidas, the, the big, but small percentage opposed right. to the, the massive gap of who most, what most people need. Most people need a website branding and logo and they're ignored and they've, they haven't felt the need to adapt and they're feeling that pressure now post COVID, especially mm -hmm. as eyeballs have all opened up and, you know, gotten a little red by staring at screen so much. Totally. But also, I mean, all service providers were mostly essential during yeah. COVID. So you didn't by gone are the days where you like walk down the street and like use the lawyer on the corner. Like you could drive to Vaughn if they have the best reviews, mm -hmm. right. Or the best marketing. So it, COVID really changed that for the old school thinkers that were like, I don't need to be online. And COVID hit and it was like, I'm not going to survive because people aren't walking into my front yeah. door anymore. Yeah, no, it's crazy. I mean, so what have you seen in the last little while at your shop for inbound? Are you getting inbound or is it something like 
Yeah, how do you attract new clients? Let's leave it there as an agency yourself. It's been a really crazy three years and it feels like almost 30. Like I've (laughs) squeezed in a lifetime and a half during the time of the pandemic. But it's, it's really interesting actually to explain to your listenership because Initially, we grew off of like referral word of mouth. People weren't really doing this for for providers or Mm. doing it in the way that we were doing. We we looked at how brands like Nike and Adidas and Aritzia have these like experiences around their brand and and Patagonia, which you can really understand without really understanding if you're not a marketer, like you you know the feel of the brand. Yeah, there's values that kind of that align with it to their customers without knowing their brand guide, right? Yeah. So we so we it it started it started kind of like taking off from there, and it was cool because almost none of our clients were in Ontario. They were in Antigua and London, England, and Poland. I love it. It was really cool during COVID. Yeah. But one of and I, what makes Startwell so great with you guys having these studios, what really changed was um, invest. It was classic case of you're so busy with what you're doing that you don't market yourself. And the cobbler's shoes. Yes, and I, or the the team and I decided, all right, let's practice what we preach. Mm-hmm. You know, we get all of our clients on video. Let's get on video. Let's start actually showcasing what we do in a different way than how agencies now uh, showcase our work on Instagram. So let's get B-roll behind the scenes of what we do and start actually putting ourselves out there. And it took about, I would say, four months to like really start getting anything and then it just took off people that you hadn't spoken to in like 10 years were reaching out I had like random people um, coming in off the internet last night I was at an event which was like actually a really big deal who came over to me and started talking and they'd been following the agency for a few months I love it she owns a medical spa so now it's kind of shifted because we have the team to produce it for everybody else, just like you do. So now we're kind of doing it for ourselves. So, yeah. but that's often service providers, as you said, the cobbler shoe dilemma. You don't put yourself out there, and that's often your biggest hindrance to getting new business because there's such an opportunity cost by not putting yourself out there. It is so worth it to invest in yourself and your own brand. Yeah, there's some sort of weird, you know. I don't know. There's this weird thing in business, right? Because especially in small business, I would say it that way. Big business is its own beast and, you know. Faceless entity. My God. We got to put a face to the small business, which makes it nerve wracking, stressful. Yeah. And also, I, I, I'll i just throw it out there. Now this is kind of segueing, but like, I hate the distinction between small and big business. Yeah. It's funny. I was talking to someone yesterday, right? And so, you know, we have our internal media production company and it's growing a little bit. We've got a couple new people. Cool. Uh, joining the team in a couple of weeks and some really awesome media production clients. And what was funny is I was talking to someone about this the other day and they were like, yeah, it's so good. You know, it's, it's really cool what you're doing because like, you know, the people don't really know if you're a big brand or a small brand. Like they just, I mean, of course you could compete with any big agency. And I'm like, wait, no, no people, our customers don't come to us because they mistake us for like WPP. Yeah, totally. You know, or cassette or anyone else that has massive payroll and, you know, um, minions and managers I pumping think you're totally out the shit. Opposite. Yeah, and we're boutique and we do some cool ass shit and people like what we do and they connect with what we do. And I think this is what I'm getting at is this kind of like authentic brand as expressed through content, you know, formed by the people. It's an interesting thing because very few organizations actually invest in that being part of their day to day, like creating that content yeah. and getting into the vernacular of digital media to be able to express themselves authentically and with ease. Because it does take a lot of effort to produce content. Yeah, totally. Uh, and then choosing the right media is a whole nother thing. Uh, and that's off, uh, often what you come in, I would think, for your clients to do is to kind of help them, guide them into what needs being done uh, in terms of where to speak and what voice to be on point and do it in a way that, you know, is sustainable. It's interesting because to me, you kind of fit into this like this like other box. And it's funny because I work with. So our, our our role, I would say to what we're kind of becoming is the 
professional branding agency. So like we specialize in creating personal and professional brands. Mm -hmm. There's kind of like a, a bit of an exit period, right? Where like we've, we've, we've built the brand, we've done the run, we've done the launch, we kind of tweak, manage, maintain. And then there's a point where this is never ending. Mm -hmm. They're never going to stop doing socials or stop get recording their, their uh, podcasts or videos or whatever it may be. And it kind of makes sense from a, like a, wh whether it's like economically or even just kind of strategically, or also they're more comfortable with it now to bring kind of somebody in house. And then we get kind of hired or retained as more like their, their consultants or their strategic thinkers, but we yeah. kind of assist their team you guys kind of come in as the kind of solution to that where their brand is built. They've, they've been kind of coached. They've gone through the videos. They know that they need to continue it, but like, where do you, where do you go? And everybody, everybody is creating content, whether mm -hmm. you're a freelancer or whether you're an influencer or whether you own a deck building company, like that's, and, and podcasts are becoming so, I don't even want to say mainstream to, boo on it but like it's becoming more accepted within personalities that previously would be like I'll never do that who's mm -hmm. gonna listen to what I have to say like you can find a podcast on anything right, right. and that's kind of what's interesting about what you guys do is you kind of fill this gap of of you don't need to work with the people that put the pieces together to continue working as the brand continues to grow and evolve yeah yeah and it's super interesting I mean I think I think this is this is also in marketing. It's interesting because there's there's been this like elephant in the room for the last two decades, right? Which is big agencies typically suck shit and they're dying. You know, it's just that they've they've had various stages of cancer that are killing them off <laughs> slowly, and they get all these injections yeah. to keep them alive. You know, um, and then in the last twenty years, particularly with digital. All these micro agencies, you know, sprung up. One yeah. of my 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 uh, one of my companies was called Design Guru, and that was cool. Yeah, back in, uh, you know, like two thousand five, uh, and then I killed it about you know maybe ten years officially, ten years later, something like that. It's but, a good run. Yeah, but for the first five years, it was all inbound, hundred percent inbound. Interesting. Uh, and I never wanted to run uh, a company doing what we were doing, which was context-sensitive design and strategy work for the development of online communities. So this is pre-social network in a popular context, Cool. pre-Facebook, um, and working with everyone from nonprofits that are cause-based organizations like the Stephen Lewis Foundation cool. um, to develop things like a multi-platform tool for AIDS educators across the continent of Africa wow. to share knowledge about grassroots approaches to demystifying AIDS and HIV. Wow. You know, where we had these mamas in Cameroon texting to a number that posted on a discussion board that could receive and reply messages from a website or from a couple different interfaces. Wow. Little tips and tools like, today I realized soccer is important to the boys in the village. So Marcus and I went and... I got him a brand new ball so that the kids would want to play with him. And suddenly they had a happy game and he's accepted now into the community. And, you know, that's something that was so adoptable by all of the educators in their network. Wow. And it was shared because this platform allowed her to be able to post it with the tools that she had. So th projects like that cool. to, uh, you know, douchey corporate stuff for Coca-Cola. So all of that was all inbound. And uh, I had a particular methodology and it was placemaking which is um, an urban kind of public space planning um, approach methodology to creating context-sensitive spaces through a mixture of observational analysis uh, and surveying. So you're kind of like, it comes out of like public space planning in, in New York with an organization I worked with in 2004 called the Project for Public Spaces, um, taking a page from William White and Jane Jacobs, um, the idea of, a city as being this place that should be furtive to community, and that's why it exists. We all come together for a reason. Um, this methodology of placemaking says, okay, well, let's say there's a park, and young mothers aren't taking their babies to that park, but it's across the road from their house. Let's figure out why, 
let's look at and they create this matrix of all these like safety factors and stuff like that transit access and links all this stuff um set up cameras let's watch the use cases cool look at population dynamics and then survey all those people including the guy who's sleeping on the bench that everyone's afraid of but shouldn't be because he has you know a, a less comfortable place to sleep instead let's figure out this stuff so really cool approach anyway i took that methodology i digitized it um thinking at the time that the world's largest public space is the interwebs. And uh, that's what our approach was. So Design Guru basically said, let's treat, you know, websites like public squares. Mm. Um, and then all these brands really kind of like loved it up. And that was a little bit back in the day where, you know, people had freedom at work. So going back to the small business, biz- big business thing, the big business, when it came to digital, whoever was on digital internally at all sorts of different teams and different companies, if they were multinationals, especially in like, let's call it the end of the 90s, into the 2000s, they had free reign. They were like the golden children in the organization because they were like, you're tasked, you're under-resourced, and because of that, we'll give you extra freedom. And go and try and win us new markets. Go and try and expand territory for us. Go and try and test some shit, you know? Um, and it wasn't marketing. It was something new. Mm. And it was very cool because all these organizations came to us saying, we want creative solutions that have legs to really develop relationships with people using digital. Uh, and then, of course, the social networks kind of corrupted the goodwill of these initiatives, I think. And then towards the end of the 2010 kind of era there, that decade, um, everything became copycat. It's like clients were looking for like buttons. Clients were looking for what they saw elsewhere. Yeah, And not doing the legwork like when we took on a new project in 2006 7 i would do a six-month analysis with all the stakeholders to really dive into what devices do they use physically what websites do they watch or look at stuff on read on research on and do a deep dive into each particular you know persona identity that we define for an interface and say what are they familiar with what are they willing to learn in order to use this and create such an in-depth like tool mm. uh, that it was it was just basically disheartening when we saw like that whole process uh, getting undermined by the want to copy something that's not a context sensitive solution. Yeah. So then I moved away from it and went into startup stuff and we started building products. But um, but anyway, fast forward to now. And I think there's a renewed interest in kind of like, you know, if nothing else, forget about the medium. It's about, you know, sharing that message with the people. Um, so it's kind of an exciting time, I think, for the large agencies to, you know, be further in the ground and the micro agencies not necessarily needing to be called or seen as micro. They're just more expert in what they do. Totally. And the agility that anyone can wield today, if they're an expert in whatever field it is in marketing, is, um, is the value. So that's really, really exciting because you could sign any client, you know, uh, like, just like us. We could work totally. with, with any customer. Especially when you're not in the CPG space, yeah. right? Like consumer yeah. packaged that's goods. That's an interesting point. Are, it's, it's so saturated. And, and really it comes down to like the RFP process where whoever can go in at the cheapest price wins. But like when you are op, when you're competing in a different category... If you're smaller, you're more nimble. You're more hungry. Mm-hmm. You're you're more you're more focused on what's coming out. You're not as comfortable. Like you can't teach hunger. Right. And if you're bloated and big with big payrolls, it's like a rat race of like you catch what you kill because you got to keep the brick and mortar lights on. But when you are nimble and when you're young, mm-hmm. like that's a big thing too it that is I a talk big about, thing. especially in digital marketing. Yeah. Growing up with an iPhone is a massive advantage compared to, I I can eat up CMOs that are in their late fifties, early sixties for breakfast. Like mm-hmm. they, they, it's, it moves at such a rapid pace that yeah. there's, there's no competition except for in the CPG space because it's just, it's so saturated and, it sounds like that's also kind of what happened to you as you were a first mover. and Yeah, in that idea. space, for sure. And I could have kept my studio alive picking and choosing projects. No problem. You know, we had enough business and, and enough of a portfolio to turn that into, you know, uh, recurring revenue and ongoing projects annualized for years. Um, 
But for me, I I always like whatever I'm doing. I like kind of that feeling of right place, right time. And as soon as that shifts for me, I want to go with it, you know. So for me, it was about tech startups and going into tech startup stuff. Um, and then that was a whole wild ride, all these different startups, uh, everything from a creative portfolio platform called Introduction IO, which was before Behance. So you're a serial preneur. A hundred percent. I've been running. Absolutely. I've been creating sustainable. This is an interesting yeah, it's thing. Huge. Like financially sustainable bootstrap businesses since I was a teenager. I was one of the first people in East Africa online in 1995. So I was one of the first hundred people online in East Africa. I literally, when I was 15, um, found the first ISP in Kenya, which was run out of a house on a muddy road down the road from where I lived. Um, A friend of mine at school's father was in the government and he threw... There was just this whole thing. Like, I was a tech geek. His son was a tech geek. And who subsequently dated Meatloaf's daughter at some point when he was at University of California. It's very weird. This just sounds like a book. Oh, my life is a, is many books. But so what happened was uh, this politician told his son, who's my friend, Michael. He said, hey, Michael, there are these guys. You really like computer stuff. You should go talk to these guys. He went there. He didn't quite understand it. He was into this BBS stuff, but, you know, he didn't really understand it because in Africa there weren't many BBSs back then. Um, So he had nowhere to dial up, but he liked the idea. Him and I jammed on it. I went to that house at his, you know, behest. Uh, I talked to the politician who was, there was a a guy who became an MP in the Kenyan government who actually had run this or started this nonprofit. And the idea he had was we want to take internet connectivity and take it out to rural schools where we can't afford textbooks. We can afford to subsidize computers. And if we connect them to leased lines, kids can learn digital literacy before cool. they even write on chalkboards. So that's what we did. And I there was a commercial side, and then there was this side um, to the business, essentially. And I got a bag of USR robotics mo- modems because a family friend owned the Yellow Pages and had a computer store. Cool. And I would take those after school all over Nairobi, installing modems and teaching people what the internet was. Wow. Banks, uh, hospitals, cool. insurance companies, and then average Joe at his house, like 15 years old. That was one of my first businesses. Do you speak Swahili? A little bit. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Very, very cool. My dad lives in Nairobi too. I oh, yeah? I told you that. He currently lives there. No, he grew up there too. He did. Okay. Which is so random. It is. That was like it my was favorite awesome. party trick when I was young. They would like bring your culture to school day. And, and my dad would put me in like traditional like Kenyan garb. And like, and it was just amazing because. I mean, yeah. Like Jumbo, hey, yeah. Jumbo, <laughs> Jumbo. And like, I don't know much more, but Jumbo, Jumbo. No, it was so awesome. And I went to school too in like Scarborough and Markham Naglington. So like, I was like the cool kid. Nice. Like I was cool kid. Like, I it can was, see it. Like I was a, a cool little kid. Like I was coming in my African garb. With my with my uh, Kenyan food. Oh, I love it. Ugali and sukuma, sukuma wiki. I can't remember. You know remember your greens anymore. and like, yeah, it's good, man. And nyamachoma. Yeah, yeah. So I kind of grew up in Kenya because cool. when I was from from ninety two, we moved there in ninety two. Um, April Fool's Day, nineteen ninety two. We packed up and moved to Kenya from it, Calgary. But it wasn't a joke. It wasn't a joke. Exactly. <laughs> I, I always say that. My dad's like, Rrr. that's amazing. And Why? Then, um, my parents are from there, so they always wanted to move back. Cool. Because all their friends, essentially, who stayed back in Kenya when, you know, the Idi Amin thing happened and we had this exodus of East Africans in 1972-ish. Uh, people left because they thought the whole East African kind of community was going to crumble into dictatorship. Wow. It became, you know, they were all dictators, but at the same time, it wasn't Idi Amin cutting off and eating heads, supposedly. Do you know anything about the whole thing? Kind of like okay. I just I I know there's a ton of bad actors and there yeah. was I I know I wouldn't want to talk like I don't know enough to talk about it but uh, suffice it to say Idi Amin comes into power military coup he's the head of the military uh, takes over kills all the politicians yes overnight announces any foreign national so that means it's a racist policy anyone who's not black get the hell out oh gosh you have like one week literally foreign government scrambling to get people out of there right India repatriating brown people that have been three generations African, born there. Wow. Um, and then Trudeau, of course, at the time, uh, luckily, said, okay, Canada's opening doors to anyone from East Africa. Just come, we'll give you a passport, we'll wow. make you citizens. 
So that was the context in which my parents moved to Canada. Um, and then as they kind of, you know, rooted in, in Alberta and stayed in Canada, um, their friends who stayed back in Kenya, which didn't go to shit and actually became a very strong economic, you know, uh, center for the whole continent and in, in really, um, they, because of corruption, all those people got extremely rich and they had like four sets of accounting and, you know, they were first movers in like tires and batteries and cooking oil and, you know, if you're going to bet, bet big, right. And they, they made a big, that was a big risk. Yeah. And they stayed and they made like wow. billions, like so much money got wealth got created wow. in the years post independence in East Africa. Anyway, so my dad always wanted to try his hand at business back then. And the recession hit here in the 90s, early 90s. Um, and weirdly... Back to Africa, boys. Yeah, and the catalyst was interesting. My dad was in uh, kitchen cabinet manufacturing mm. and renovations. And one night, someone left the paint booth door open. And a rag spontaneously combusted. And it blew up the whole factory. Like a oh fire. Oh my gosh. Fire burnt everything. Now... They find out the next day that the accountant or their bookkeeper didn't renew the insurance a week before this. Oh, my gosh. And so my dad was like, okay, I have $25,000 in the bank. We're packing up and moving to Africa. So it was quite ballsy. Oh and he's gosh. an entrepreneur and he always has cool. been. So I get a lot of that from him. But anyway, so that was some of the impetus for moving there. And then it's been a back and forth thing, you know, and, and I've been in Toronto since 2005, since I left uh, New York. So this is now home. Wow. Yeah. What a cool story. Yeah. There's so many twists and turns. There's so much to that. And the number of businesses I've started and put to bed uh, is is numerous. Like I haven't even created a list. But uh, but yeah, there's there's definitely tons of lessons. And, and I always found that like doing the services side of the digital stuff that I did as design guru, was actually, of course, it's informed every business since then. But it's it was one of the most exciting businesses because I just love dealing with different clients all the time. It's so much fun. Right? So much fun. I have, like, literally the best job in the world. Like, any given day, I am any, any single profession dealing with complex problems, solving them, and then the kicker is telling them what to do. And them loving it and it working like it's it's so stimulating for your brain it's so rewarding it's so enjoyable it's so much fun so third eye insights has been three years running now it started as a side hustle okay so it's been um functioning for about six years and um and then to give to give this a a a, a spark notes mm -hmm. quick run through yeah basically it got to a point where I had a full time job this was very much just like fun on the side enjoyable I liked it didn't think that anything could possibly come out of it and um and I kept getting more referrals but my full time job started becoming more demanding mm -hmm. and I was at this crossroads of I got to pick one. Mm -hmm. And I didn't think that working for somebody else was the best use of my skill sets. Mm -hmm. So I decided to take the plunge and do it. Yep. And that was um, about three years ago. And uh, then COVID hit. And I had heart failure because I was like, I mean, my generation in Canada hasn't really gone through like a war right or a pandemic yeah or a recession really right. like we were too young yeah 9 11 i was in grade one so whoa let's just stop there grade one 9 11 i could tell you story i could tell you what happened that day i could tell you too i was getting picked up from Damn. grade one <laughs> <laughs> my mom told me in the car I verbatim i was like wearing my mom's cherokee and i'm like mom I had a really bad day at school today she just looked at me she goes so did the world camille <laughs> Wow. I'll never forget it. But so yeah. I I had no idea what was going to happen. After I was going to come that, out of it. Yeah. And I, so I gave myself like three days to sulk because I just figured like everything was going to go to the toilet and uh, read a whole bunch, almost 
actually a lot of the books you have downstairs on the bookshelf, which makes me laugh. When you I, were when young, I, you were, you read those. Oh yeah. You grew up on business books. Head down. I'm I'm I wouldn't say that I'm special or exceptionally smart. I just try. Yeah. Like I just I just try. Like I just read, consume whatever I can. But it ended up working. So three years of it being like full time, kind of what it what it is now. Yeah. Um. Is is yeah has been the third eye story. And um, so the lawyer thing. Uh, I met Mr. Miller. Yeah. So he's one of the clients. Was he one of the first clients? Was he? Were you working at his law firm before? Was yeah. So yeah. that was the job. It was so. The story is funny. So I, I wanted to be a lawyer. I wanted to be a lawyer since I was a child, but my concept of law was pretty much a mixture of Murphy Brown being told I'm really good at arguing, yeah, but then Legally Blonde, okay, and Suits, yeah, which came later. I'm like, this looks great, totally for me. Everyone is really fashionable. Looks like a great place to work. Yeah. Um. So I was in my undergrad and I'm like, okay, this is it. This is what I'm going to do. But I had to pay to go to school myself. Right. And that is a very expensive yeah, ticket. Yeah, law school is apparently expensive. A hundred and something thousand. My God. My God. So I was like, okay, well, um, I don't have parents that are going to fund this. So let me find myself an internship. So I moseyed my way and found myself a position at Millar's Law. Mm. And it was, I, I really... I wouldn't say I'm particularly religious, but I feel like it was really meant to be because he was a great person for how my brain thinks to work for. He's very out of the box thinker, um, very interesting background. And yeah, very, military man, right? Yeah. And very much believes in it doesn't matter what credentials you have. It's how hard you're prepared to work. Mm. So he like I, I was like thrown in with the sharks. Like I was doing like lawsuits in second year university. I was sitting second chair in drug trials in London. And he was like, if this is what you want, here you go. It's yeah. it's yours to lose. Wow. And I, he's a really amazing trial lawyer. Like he's really, I would say probably one of the best in Canada, like for how his, like his understanding of like human psychology and actually seeing like real stuff in war. Like just, he doesn't, he doesn't screw around. Like mm. he's a he's a tough dude. But what I hated about the law was the clerical stuff. Mm. And I as much chutzpah as I have, I don't have the chutzpah to be a to be a trial lawyer like he yeah, does. Yeah. And I really gravitated that kind of like your story. This is when like Facebook marketing was cutting edge. Mm -hmm. And I, I had done like a comp sci course at Western and I like got on Adobe and I was like editing graphics and so I kind of more gravitated towards like doing socials for him and I would like capture him doing ridiculous stuff and like film him and put it on Facebook and started working and making him a lot of money and then he was like well do you kind of want a job here like we'll we'll pay you to keep doing this because making lots of money and I'm like sure and then he kind of started telling his buddies in London that were realtors and and doctors etc like this is really working for my practice you should try it and sure. I was a waitress at that time and I'm like, this is way better money. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. just do some graphics on Adobe and I don't like I don't have to work Friday, Saturday, and Sunday night. Like this is amazing. Yeah. So that's kind of how like the third <laughs> eye started. And he's like, there's legs here. And he basically ended up sitting me down your, I think it was your three in my undergrad, and was like, if you want to go to law school, we'll support it. You'll you will be a great lawyer, but I don't think you'll be happy. Right. I think that this is like really you're, what you're made to do. Like yeah. you're you're born for this. Like this is what you should get into, and we're prepared to help you start this business. So that's how the the third eye insights TI kind of started. And um, so yeah, so he was, and he still is a client. He now actually works for the agency, which is awesome because right, yeah, he so. loves to market he's got a great brain for it he's at a point in his life too where his law firm is doing really well and we get really cool clients that it's so awesome to be able to work with your mentor right like you you get the kind of the new age like young approach but some of like the strategy behind marketing it's it's timeless mm -hmm. right like good thinking in marketing is really hard to find totally, and yeah. when you have a, a a good group of minds like it's 
you get some really cool stuff done. So that's how it started. Miller's Law is still a client. Um, I get in trouble or in in trouble all the time because it doesn't get the attention that it used to get. But um, that's how it started. And that's how I realized that I no longer wanted to be a lawyer, but instead tell lawyers what to do. Yeah, (laughs) I like that. No, that's brilliant, man. I think it's so cool that your your company was born out of, you know, a real product market fit exercise. It's like, yeah, these guys need this, but it wasn't creating a business. It was about finding solutions passion. and passion. But, yeah, yeah, and I I say I I'm a huge advocate for young people regardless if you're in a financial position or not. Go try what you think you want to do. Time yeah. is finite. Like there's so many people I know that go to law school because they they score well in the LSAT, their parents, and they think it's a good thing to do and they're willing to pay for it. And you can't get back four years of your life, even though Honestly, there's... It, it's tough to go... Yeah, it's tough to change gears once you're on that trajectory, right? Totally. Like, I know so many professionals. It's weird because it's only since I got married. No, even the, even before that. I, I remember telling this to people and they were surprised. I think at some point I counted, I knew before getting married where... You know, I got more, I guess, a bit in deeper with our community. And, and typically there are a lot of professionals. I mean, a smiley. I don't know if you've heard of our, our people, but, uh, you know, a lot of professionals in the community. But before that, yeah, I knew at some point when I was like 25 or something, I knew like 28 lawyers. Yeah. And just like personal connections. And all of those people now, or a lot of them, are so set in their career and they feel like they've kind of paid their dues so far that there's no way they can change careers. And there was a reckoning in the pandemic where a lot of big firms... Totally. The great right, resignation even. ...were like, yeah. like, either they got they were basically saying that like everyone needs to pay out of pocket for a little while to recoup, or you know people took some clients and they splintered and started yeah. their own practices. All sorts of stuff happened. And... Um, it's super interesting to just like talk to some of the people I know who are lawyers and say like, what do you want to do? Like I just last weekend I was at my friend's house and she's like a, a partner in a very big law firm and her big dream is to open a cheese shop. And I'm like, every time I talk about this with her, what's when, stopping you? When are you going to do when it? When are you going to do it? Totally. Oh, it's money. It's this, it's that. If I, I can't get my money out now, I have to you essentially the same it's story safety. It's, it's safety t- yeah. but but we love what we do yeah i see when i come yeah. you're, I you're so happy you love yeah. what you do i love what i do yeah. like what a gift and gift is the wrong word because you should love what you do we spend so much of our lives in our work but it's like a dirty little secret you know like in society in, yeah. in canada in our middle class nine to five society like you can love what you do yeah it's like that's not allowed that's, that's, a, that's, that's a, like that that's is, for the weekend yeah no that's for um after 8 p.m., you got to love it. It's like you get one shot. You get one go. Yeah. Why not invest truly what your passion is into do like into what you do every day? And that's I I really think that whether it's the schooling system, whether it's societal pressure, whatever it is, it's failing young people. And I think we're seeing it with the great resignation. I think we're seeing it with people talking about mental health and mm-hmm. trying to achieve work life balance. I was actually in a meeting with a client. She's brilliant. And she uh, has a mental health um, app that's kind of above and beyond just an app. But anyways, she was talking about how the future of healthcare and the future of benefits for like a workplace, it's no longer like let's stop trying to say that there's a balance between work and life. Mm. Your work is your life. Your life is your work. It's all one find joy and balance within like trying to stop separating them yeah absolutely how, how can you live in the evenings and on the weekends and then enjoy what are you doing in the daytime you're yeah. a zombie no enjoy of your work yeah. like and that's it's so so simple but so um enlightening especially when you're someone like us like i love what I do all day. Mm -hmm. I take a break from it and I start again the next day. It's like my favorite hobby that that pays well and allows me to have really cool people that I get to grow my mind with. Mm -hmm. No. And it's, it's very interesting because I feel like there's a lot of kind of generational, um, bias, uh, generational, uh, knowledge gap that happens, you know, um, people for maybe centuries in their family, in their genetics have been programmed 
away from totally. risk taking, which is crazy. Totally. Right? And then, of course, aside from that, there's societal stuff, and we don't think about it. Totally. But who moved here, stole the land, and created this country? And what of their culture is everybody subconsciously inheriting in a day to day that limits them being um, celebrators of their diversity, of their opportunity culturally? Their difference. Their difference. Yeah, and totally. Because of that, you know, what's holding us all back from being free, being happy, feeling enabled, feeling empowered, feeling honest, you know, and all this stuff. So that's, you know, obviously like there's some meta topics to unpack. Totally. But I and in my company, as you know, at Startwell, am all for people embracing a path to success through happiness. Totally. And uh, so we see it every day with people here, right? Everyone's hopefully, for the most part, kind of super happy, right? Loves working together, yeah. loves what they do, and getting out of the house to like separate work from life, but in a really positive space. Yeah, it's about focusing on your work. But it feels be, like a second home. It's it's super yeah. comfortable. But and this is all not to say that you can't love what you do in law or love what you do in the medical profession. But that goes back to what we were talking about with finding more of what you love because there's a lot of lawyers that really don't jive with their clients mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. and hate what they do because of who they have to work with. And that's why branding is so important because if you love what you do, it's rewarding to get more of the kind of clients you like to work with, mm-hmm. which makes your job more rewarding and it's it's just it's not a rat race or you're on you know the hamster wheel of I, I'm doing this for a paycheck I hate it how can I get through today how do I get home most I would say it like this right I've worked on three continents in the multitude of businesses I've run or worked for um, I've witnessed all almost all levels of like wealth and income People firsthand are happier. Yeah, I've shot documentaries in the slums of Kenya cool. and I know, you know, people who are hundreds of millionaires, if not billionaires, uh, or I used to know them. <laughs> Guys, give me a call. It's been a while. Um, <laughs> but the thing is, through no matter who you are, and uh, no matter how much you make, there's that question of like, you know, you're either striving for what uh, is enough, you know, and a lot of the drama of your work is getting to a point where you can be able to earn, you know, that uh, amount that enables you to feel comfortable, you know, and feel safe. And of course, there's all these things Law to do diminishing with diminishing returns. Yeah. Yeah. Like figure out a point. Yeah. So there's the money stuff. And then there's that, like that can kind of take yes. someone away from finding fulfillment in work. Uh, yeah. And then there's just politics. I, I see it as those two things. There's like money issues and then there's politics and people can be assholes, you know, and people can accept that truth too easily work with assholes support assholes and be beaten down and feel like it's a necessary part of their work because that's our hashtag stop the stop the assholes yeah exactly <laughs> stop the assholes <laughs> dot com register that it's it's and and it's a funny thing I, I people shank each other like i i little blip uh in my career was this hilarious period when i worked for ibm you know, and I'm not that guy, right? IBM is a Dilbert strip in a, in a cartoon in a newspaper. Literally, it's so much red tape. It's ridiculous. Like, I got fired uh, by a guy who then himself apparently got fired for being, like, a racist mm. and other things. Um, but when he fired me, it was hilarious because I had really never met him before. And he didn't know anything about my job. I found out after the fact that... I was hired in through the company that uh, I worked with. I ran a startup program for SoftLayer, which was a cloud infrastructure company that was out of Texas. Texas, This Texas company couldn't grow globally because there was infighting amongst the owners and none of them wanted to like go to Japan to open a data center, but they needed to grow globally. Otherwise, they were going to lose market share and they would crumble. So they decided to put it on the chopping block and sell it. Rackspace and SoftLayer were the two uh, best kind of horses out there uh, in the market. And IBM was a little screwed because the Pentagon had approached IBM to offer tender uh, on a private cloud for uh, the spy 
infrastructure. And it was a $2 billion contract. And they ended up picking up soft layer for something like one and a half or one billion. So they had turnkey infrastructure to win the bid, which they did. Um, and then they had money in, in bank from that one contract to scale growth globally. Wow. Now they had infrastructure uh, and, a, and a blueprint because software was built to be modularly scalable uh, without limits as a data center infrastructure. So every data center, every screw in every computer was exactly the same. The wiring was exactly the same. It was like an Ikea. And so they could roll them out anywhere. And they had all these redundancy plans and dark fiber around the world and stuff. Anyway, so IBM buys SoftLayer, fires all the SoftLayer employees, offers them rehiring packages, which I think is illegal, um, if they want a job. Yeah, I think that is. Then you work at IBM and you find out after the fact, or at least for me, that um, they only hired me because SoftLayer gave them a chunk of cash as part of that acquisition to rehire their employees, but there was a cap on how long that cash was for. It was to finish the employment year. So as soon as that employment year that we were mid-year in finished, IBM hadn't in Canada, and also all the territories where our my colleagues were hired into, IBM didn't have money on its books budgeted for that role. Oh, interesting. So when the cash ran out, they didn't try and find the money. They just said, we don't need that role, I guess, because we inherited it, so ciao. But no one told me this, you know, until like six months after I left IBM, um, a former manager three levels up, you know, gave me the full spiel. Wow. And I was laughing because I was like, okay, well. I, I mean, that's I'm, not personal. Yeah. I'm like, well, I was just trying to do good for IBM, you know, like I didn't really care about that job as being like pinning my hopes and dreams for yeah, my life yeah, yeah. on it. Um, so it was really interesting. But uh, while I was there, I did witness what was, I thought, the hilarity of me being there, which was the Shank Fest. Like, it's not a joke. Like, oh, yeah. how serious people every day are avoiding bosses and being on calls and just doing, like, FaceTime. I don't mean the, the app, but, like, they're putting in FaceTime whenever they can to just show up because showing up is their job. They don't yeah. do work. They no. push paper around. And there's tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of IBM employees I can't imagine that fit that, that MO. I, I can't I can't imagine time is so precious yeah. and just like wasting it. Why waste your life? Like just showing up and watching YouTube videos all day. Like it it literally blows my mind. But that's why I love working here because it makes it so productive. It's so it's so nice to get out of the house be able to be working around other super smart cool people it's such a great motivator and to spend your time better around yeah. good people yeah in a good space thank you thank you it was a pleasure chatting on this very long episode likewise <laughs> you're great <laughs> oh so are you thanks so much <laughs> all right um before we leave our audience yep Third Eye Insights, anything coming up? Anything you want to like welcome feedback or participation partnership on? If anyone's watching this saying, hey, Camille seems cool. I want to do some stuff with her and her people. I am open to anything. Okay. Your website URL is? ThirdEyeInsights.ca. Awesome. It'll be underneath this video wherever it's posted and on the Startwell magazine. Amazing. And we will uh, see you guys next episode. And thank you once again for joining me. Thank you so much, Kasim.